politics, there are certain issues that you don't touch. And they say if you touch them, then it could be the end of your career. They call those issues third rail issues. Anybody know what the third rail is? Uh, in some subway systems, you've got a subway, uh, the train that goes, it goes on two rails, and there's a rail down in the middle that is highly electrified. And if you were to get down and touch that rail, do you know what happens? You die. <laughs> and, and that third rail is something that you avoid, those third rail issues. Uh, one of them would be something like social security, if you're a politician. You just don't touch that. If you bring that up, if you try to tackle that, if you try to change it, that could be the end of your career. You touch it, you die. Well, churches have a similar issue as well, or some churches have a similar issue as well, and that similar issue is the issue of worship and music. You touch that rail, you touch it the wrong way, you die. And when you look across the United States and across the world, you've got hundreds and thousands of churches, and every Church, it seems, has their own philosophy when it comes to this. And some churches like to look down on other churches and criticize the way that they do it and the way that they approach it. And when you look at that, you see there have been lots of books that have been written on the issues. And some of them are helpful, some of them not so much so. And a lot of times those books deal extensively with forms of worship. When you look at those forms of worship... I think it's important to realize that a lot of what we write, not everything, but a lot of what we write and talk about when it comes to this are applications of principles from the Bible. And here's the thing about applications. Applications can be fallible. Uh, applications, when it comes down to it, can even change over time. So when you look at the scripture, the scripture talks a lot about music. And it talks about some forms of worship, but it's not explicit on all forms of worship. But there are these things that are crystal clear in the scripture about worship, singing, praise, those type things. And the Psalms give us some of those best truths. Not so much nuts and bolts today is what we're going to look at. We want to look at heart. I almost said heart here. That one. <laughs> heart, head, and emotions. And this is what the Psalms teaches us, and Psalm 33 catches this purpose well. This is a psalm of worship. You know, we've looked at different types of psalms. That's what we've been going through this summer. And this is a psalm of worship, and it centers on who God is, what God does, and our need for Him. Let's look at it here. Psalm 33. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to Him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright. All His work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of His mouth all their host. He gathers the water, waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of His heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom He has chosen is His heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. And where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. And those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him, because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope. 
in you. And Lord, we do declare our hope in you now. Lord, our eyes are on you. I know your word has been read and you've spoken to us in that way. But Lord, I, as the shepherd that you've put over this flock, I stand here. And Lord, I want to help your people. Lord, I want to bless your children. Lord, I pray that you would put a guard over my mouth, that I would not say anything that is out of line with your word. Holy Spirit, would you come and lead me? Would you fill me? Protect me from my flesh, Lord. My flesh gets in the way so often. Lord, I pray that that which is true would be uh, settled deep in our hearts. And if there's anything I say that's out of line, Lord, that it would come to naught. Would you help me to speak? Not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. For my brothers and sisters and friends, Lord, I pray that you would speak to them as well. We have a greater awareness of who you are and how our lives can line up with you and the truth that you show us here. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you were to put this in a thought that you could take home and think about this week and chew on, I would say this. Worship flows from knowing who God is what He does, and our need for Him. Worship has to flow from that. Worship has to come from that. We're not 100% certain who wrote this particular psalm. There's not an uh, inscription at the top. This is in a section of psalms that David wrote, and the assumption is, is that he wrote it. So if you hear me say David, it's because I'm thinking that. But the psalmist is the safest way to say it. We've seen, as we've looked at the psalms, a wide range of emotions human emotions that the psalmist deals with and different truths that he deals with, uh, anxiety, fear, faith, confidence. Last week we saw repentance. We've seen sorrow. And Psalm 31 opens with something new that we haven't seen yet. Look at how it begins. It, it starts with the concept of shouting for joy in the Lord. Shouting for joy in in the Lord, giving thanks, stringed instruments, new songs, loud shouts. Now, you might get a little nervous when we talk about loud shouts. I know, um, I know, I do sometimes. Uh, I've seen lots of people worship in different ways. I've seen people run aisles. I mean, just get up and run around. Uh, I've seen video of one guy who ran in circles came from the back all the way down here, took his suit coat off as he was coming, threw it on the two people who were singing. They're covered with his coat. He goes up into here, into the choir loft, and jumps in the baptismal pool. He was rather excited about what they were singing about. Um, you know, I would not I recommend jumping a pew First of all, you'd hurt yourself. I heard someone say this. First of all, you'd hurt yourself. Our liability insurance would go up. So that's probably not the best way to uh, tackle that. But lots of people uh, go at it different ways. Some people like to smile when they are singing, when they're worshiping. Some people like to raise their hands. Some people are very serious. Some people are very reverent. I think for us to really understand what's going on here, I'm going to set the table a little more. All right, just a little more introduction than we would normally do as we look at this because I want to make sure that we're, we have the right frame of mind as we're heading into it. There are different views about the way that we approach God in worship. There are some who believe that we are coming to the presence of a holy God and reverence is the right way, and that is absolutely true. There are some on the other side of it who would say, well, bless God. We're the redeemed children of God. We've been forgiven. Jesus came and he died for us. We're on our way to heaven. We're on the winning side. And that really ought to show up in what we do. And they're going to be much more expressive in the way that they approach that. They'll actually say that if you don't have fire and passion in your worship, then you're not really worshiping God and you're not really a good Christian when it comes down to it. You'll have people who intentionally whip crowds up trying to get them to approach that way. But both of those, in different contexts, in different settings, and even different types of music, have their place, that reverence, that joy, that passion, that fire. But both of those, each one on its own, if you just have one approach without the other, they are incomplete on their own. We really need both of them. Now, there's 
One other thing before we jump deeply into the passage here to keep in mind, and, and that is that worship is not limited to music. We have, I think in our minds, we have tried to limit it. We talk about, oh, the worship at church was good, or we're going to go and we're going to worship the Lord. And we draw that line to where it's just there with music. Well, worship has the idea of giving worth or value to something. It's often expressed outwardly through our actions. So worship isn't simply raising your hands or singing. Worship is the way that we live our lives. As Paul said in Corinth, whatever you do, whether you eat, or whether you drink, whatever you do, do all of that to the glory of God. So all of life is worship. The time and effort that we give things is an indication of our priorities and what's important to us. It's, a, it's an indication of the worth that we give those things. So work can be worship in two ways. First of all, we can worship our work in a sinful way, right? But work can also be worship when we realize, as we saw in Genesis chapter 1, that we're the image bearers of God, and that what we do, we can do those things for His glory, to where when we do those things well, we're pointing back to Him and what He's done in our life. Work can be worship. Uh, things can be worship. Hobbies can be worship. People can be worship. Worship also occurs in two different ways when we gather. It occurs through singing. And it also occurs in the preaching of the word and the way that we respond to God. So yes, music is worship, and we'll see that here, but preaching and the response can be worship as well. If we worship through music and hear God's word after that, but don't respond to his word and don't line our lives up with what we hear in our words, then what we did earlier, what we called worship, was really empty. When it comes down to it. Because we're just singing words and not lining our lives up with truth. And this is what we're going to see here today. The essence of worship is lining our lives up with truth. Now in the Psalms, music is the most common aspect of worship. Now I'm going to be honest. When you read about it in the Psalms, it's not usually quiet. It's exuberant. And if you have any question about that, go read Psalm 150. And you'll see the exuberance that is there. But when you look at this, if you were to boil this down, I think we're going to see here that our worship should flow from truth and knowledge of God. And let me take that back. I'm not going to say I think. I know that our worship should flow from knowledge and who we know God is. So let's look here at Psalm 33. And this is focusing more, it seems here at the start, on the musical aspect of worship. So this is what he says. He says, Shout for the joy, or shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. When you look at this, we see, first of all, that worship is an outward expression. Now, again, it can be more than that. We read a little earlier in Hebrews eleven twenty one 21 that Jacob bowed on his staff. And I think the implication there is that he quietly worshipped the Lord. God had brought him to the end of his life, and his family is there in front of him, and he's about to bless them. And Jacob is worshipping the Lord. It can be inward, and it can be quietly but it's certainly not just an inward practice. Worship has outward expressions as well. Look at the words that David uses here. Shout for joy, praise, give thanks, sing, play guitars. I mean, I just kind of added it. He's talking about playing on the strings. That can be violins, it can be guitars. In that day, it would have been a harp. It would have been a lyre. Play on the strings. Shout with loud shouts. Now, if we had seen this in action with them, our thinking would be, this is probably a little more Pentecostal than high church. Now, I've been some places where this was put in practice. Like, literally, I almost lost my hearing once from a guy behind me on a pew who was shouting throughout the entire singing and throughout the entire preaching as well. well let's boil this down to what it is. David, if he is the psalmist here, is giving us an emotional response that is tied into music. 
Now, I don't think that it has to be prescriptive, like prescribed, that everyone has to shout. I'm not necessarily the shouting type. But you can see that whatever it is that is moving him this way is moving him in a way that is tied into his heart and to his emotions. I think the principle is that worship should engage our emotions. So what is it that brings this response here? What is it that causes the psalmist, or if it's David, that causes him to respond this way? Was it a great victory that they had had? You know, that they'd gone in and they beat the Philistines or something like that. Uh, had one of his enemies fallen? Uh, had he just heard a good song? Well, I don't know, but I know this, that worship, while it is an outward expression, worship is also an outward expression of inward knowledge. Now look in verse 4. There's a key word here at the beginning of the verse. What is the first word that is there? The word is for. You could also say because. Worship this way, with the shouting, with the singing that David is talking about here, for or because. He's giving us the reason for worshiping and praising God. You can really group what he does here over the next few verses. You could group it into three sections. First of all, he says that worship is a response to or it is understanding God's nature. Look at, look at how he says this here. For the word of the Lord is upright. He's saying that God speaks truth to us. God communicates with us, and what he communicates is upright, it is right, and it is good. God can be known. You've heard me say it before. We don't know God from nature. We do know of God from nature. We call that natural revelation. But the only way that we know God, we know who we are, we know about his son, and what his son did to us is through the scripture, through specific or special revelation. And that, that revelation is good and it is upright. And the psalmist is saying we should praise the Lord in this way because we have the word of the Lord. God communicates with us. He also says that God does everything that he does, and it's rooted in faithfulness. I was reading this uh, earlier this summer as I was preparing for this series, going through these psalms, and I was, just, I was just struck by that phrase. It grabbed me that everything that the Lord does is done in faithfulness. There is never one thing that he has done in your life that wasn't tied to his faithfulness to you. And so at times, when it seems like everything has gone sideways and we wonder where the faithfulness of God is, we can trust that he is sovereignly still tying that to his faithfulness and working out of his faithfulness. I think this is expressed in the New Testament in Romans chapter 8, in, in verse 28, where he works things together for our good to where we can ultimately be conformed. In verse 27, he says, we can be conformed to the image of his Son. So when you see how God works, it's understanding his nature, that he speaks truth to us, and that everything that he does is rooted in faithfulness. So we can always understand what God is doing, but we can always trust him in the middle of it. It's also, he continues, rooted in God's nature and his justice and his righteousness. He loves righteousness and justice. In a day when we're talking a lot about righteousness and justice and human beings' inability to uh, always administer righteousness and justice correctly, God always is just. God will never treat you in a way that is unjust. Doesn't that give you a lot of comfort? God will never treat you in a way that is unjust. He will never treat you in a way that is not in line with His righteousness. He won't ever wrong you, and God won't ever wrong anyone else. So it's His Word that we see here. It is His faithfulness as we begin to understand His nature. It is His justice and righteousness. And then He says that God's steadfast love fills the earth. So... Again, notice what he's done. He's had this music, this worship, and it is in response to, for 
We have God's word. We have his justice and righteousness. We have his faithfulness. And now he says we have his steadfast love. We see it today in the gospel. His steadfast love that our sins, which are many, find his mercy, which is more. And because of the work of Jesus, he forgets our sins. He chooses to remember our sins no more. So that when we, and you've heard me say it before, when we come to him and say, God, I'm sorry I messed up again. He says, what have you done again? Because he's forgotten the other things that we've done. That is his steadfast love. That is why God will never leave you because his love isn't based on what you do. His love is based on what Jesus did. And he'll never abandon the work of Jesus. He'll never step away from the work of Jesus. We know this as, we know this as the gospel. The gospel is something that we believe at salvation, but the gospel is something that we live in day in and day out. The gospel is the source of our assurance and our hope because the gospel is a picture of the steadfast love of God. So when we understand the magnitude of our God loving us the way, uh, loving us this way, knowing who we are, I'm not... I'm not saying that you have to shout. But my goodness, something ought to be splashing around on the inside. This, this, is, this is what the psalmist is talking about. When he thinks about the nature of God, it goes into his head, and he understands that, but it makes his way to his heart. And then it comes out in the way that he lives his life, but also it comes out in the way that he worships God. I mean, just think about what we sang earlier today. We are his enemy that is now seated at his table. That's worthy of a loud amen, or at least singing your guts out while you're doing that. So, it is understanding God's nature for God does this, or God is this, this, and this. And, and then the psalmist tells us that it is also, worship is rooted in understanding God's power. Now notice there's a switch here. He talks about who God is. And now he's going to begin to talk about what God does. Verse 6. He created everything with his word. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. Game, set, match right there. The God that we worship spoke and everything came into existence. But the millions of neutrons and neurons and the DNA that is in your body, the hosts and the trillions upon trillions of stars that there are. He just spoke it. And it happened. So when you think about what he does or what he has done, and then you tie that into the fact that he loves you, it begins to set us back on our heels a little bit. We we begin to understand how David or the psalmist could have this response here. God created everything with his word. When we understand God's power, we understand that he rules over nature. Look at verses 7 through 9. He gathers the water, waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. I can't help but think of Israel crossing the Red Sea here. And I, I think this is probably on the psalmist's mind as well. And also when they cross the Jordan River. I mean, God defied the forces of nature, this is why it's supernatural. He overruled the forces of nature and made the waters stand in a heap. Also can't help but look at verses 8 and 9 and the response to that and think about Jesus when he was on the earth. Look at verse 8. Let all the earth, in response to this, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. I think of Jesus. Two different instances. When he's in the boat with the disciples and they are afraid that they are about to die. And Jesus, one time he's asleep. He says, peace be still. And the raging storm becomes instant calm. Anybody remember what the response of the disciples was? They fell down and they worshipped him. Because they knew that type power could only come from God. 
Then in another instance, in the book of John, um, Jesus is on a mountain. He sees the disciples uh, probably about four miles out. They're out in the middle of the, uh, of the big lake there. There's this big storm that swooped down on them. They're rowing against the waves. They're not making a headway. Jesus walks on the water to them. Peter ends up walking on the water. Jesus gets in the boat. And it says that when, when Jesus got in the boat, that the waves became calm. And, and Peter's response is, depart from me, Lord. I, I'm not worthy to be here right now. So when we see God's power, that he created everything with his word, that he rules over nature, our response to that is all, or should be all. It should be fear, not necessarily terror, but a strong appreciation and respect for who he is. It's understanding God's power, and not just that he created the world with a word and that he rules over, nation, uh, over nature, but also that he rules over men. This is God's power. Look down in verse 10. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. He rules over men. Men try to overthrow God's counsel and they fail. They are frustrated continually when they try to overrule the sovereign purposes of God. His purposes, we are told here in verse 11, His counsel, His purposes, they stand forever. They can't be beat. And if anything, as we went through the first 11 chapters of Genesis, if anything should stand out from that, it's that no matter how much man plans to overthrow God, man is unable to do that. From their wickedness before the flood to the way that they try to rule the world to the Tower of Babel. At every turn, God's purposes won. God's power is seen in that He created everything with His Word. He rules over nature and He rules over men. His plan always wins. And verse 12 reminds us that any people are better off when they line up with that plan rather than resisting it. Blessed is the nation. Whose God is the Lord, the people whom He has chosen as His heritage. So, again, in the beginning of this, we've seen this, we've seen this shouting, we've seen this singing, we, we, we've seen this music, if you will, and this response comes for or because of God's nature, His power. And then the psalmist closes it this way by reminding us that genuine worship is an outward expression of inward knowledge. And it is understanding our need for Him. A knowledge of our need for Him. Look how he says in verse 13. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where He sits enthroned, He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those who hope in His steadfast love, that He may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. The psalmist here is telling us that God observes man from heaven. He fashioned our hearts. He knows our hearts. When you see what's going on here, we realize that this is a hard world that we live in. And we're tempted to think that survival is dependent on our strength, on our wit, and on our power. From the national level all the way down to the personal level. We think we can hack it on our own in some way. That's the way the kings of this earth think. I mean, this is, this is what the psalmist is saying here. They, they try to gain power. They try to keep control with armies. And might and weapons, speaking of the horse here. Now, I'm not saying that those things are of no effect and we shouldn't have those. Thank the Lord for Ronald Reagan and his willingness to outmuscle the Soviet Union, right? 
we can fall into the same trap. Thinking that resources, money, prestige, and power are a means of rescue for us. What God is saying is that these things ultimately won't save in the end. A nation's military might cannot withstand God's judgment. I'm looking at you, Rome. Because Rome rotted from the inside out in a lot of ways. A nation's military might won't stand up against God. Even Israel is God's chosen people. They could not win without God's help. Think about as they went into the promised land and Achan had taken the, uh, the idols and the, the spoil there and he had hidden it. And they went out, they had superior forces and they should have been able to beat the city that they were going against and it was total failure because God ultimately wasn't fighting for them. It wasn't the war horse that was going to bring rescue to them. It was going to be God. When you stand before God, your resources, your money, your prestige, and your power, they won't rescue you. No, the psalmist is telling us here that genuine worship flows from who God is, what He does, and understanding of our need for Him. When we realize our need, when we have the heart that's talked about here at the end, of those who fear Him, who hope in His steadfast love, when that is our heart, then Psalm 40 comes into play. The rescue happens when we set our hearts and our confidence in God's steadfast love. Psalm 40 happens. He's in the pit. You took my feet out of the pit. You put them on the rock. You established my way. You put a new uh, song in my mouth. You established my goings. It flows from knowing our need for Him. The psalmist closes by telling us what genuine worship should lead to. Verse 20 through 21. Our soul waits on you. You are our help. And shield. This is what it should lead us to. Our heart is glad in you because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O oh Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. When we see the nature of God, the power of God in our need, yes, that will lead to worship, but it will also lead to joy and gladness as we hope in God. Now, there's some practical things that we want to take away from this. Again, this is more big picture, heart and head and emotions versus nuts and bolts. All right, so kind of two big thoughts. I'm going to have a few small thoughts under that. Big thought number one is this. Worship is a function of the heart, head, and emotions. We're talking about in music. And we see all of those things at play here. And we should work to avoid the ditches of defective knowledge, unbelief, and apathy or disobedience. What do we mean by that? Well, like most truths, there are ditches on either side of the road. We talked about that when we were going through Galatians. You can go too far one way or the other and end up hurt either way, end up out of the biblical balance either way. So worship that doesn't affect the heart and emotions may be rooted in defective knowledge. So this is this last part here. I just kind of summarize it. Avoid the ditches of defective knowledge, unbelief, and apathy or disobedience. Worship that does not affect the heart and emotions may be rooted in defective knowledge. Is what we are singing truly showing us God's nature, His power, and our need? This is why it is so important that our music be rooted in Scripture and in right doctrine and in exalting Christ. Because if it's not rooted in those things, then we're just running from emotions and it's not flowing from knowledge of God and who He is. You probably noticed that we sing old songs and we need to sing new songs. And what I try to do is find the best of the best in both. Things that are going to turn our eyes to Jesus. Turn our eyes to the nature and goodness of God. Turn our eyes to who we actually are and how much we need Christ. 
Worship that doesn't affect the heart and emotions may be rooted in effective knowledge. Also, worship that doesn't affect the heart and emotions may be rooted in unbelief. We sing, but don't believe the things that we sing about God. And that can happen one of two ways. It could be somebody who has never actually trusted Christ. So you're singing about the concept of salvation and rescue and being saved. But that's not really you. You've never been born again. You've never experienced the forgiveness that comes from the gospel. So when you sing that, it's not going to engage your heart. It's not going to engage your emotions. You've never understood your need. And I, I don't say that in an arrogant way because every single person here who was saved had to come to the point where they understood their need. I had to come to the point where I understood my need and that Jesus was the only hope that I had. And when you see what Jesus has rescued you from, then yes, that can impact your heart and your emotions. But it's rooted ultimately in what God has done. It's rooted ultimately in truth. You could also be someone who is saved and battling unbelief. You know, sometimes there are songs that we sing, and I'm like, I want that to be true, but I'm having a hard time believing that now. And so it's not engaging my heart because that battle is there. Let me go ahead and say, just like all truth, let's go ahead and say it. Let's go ahead and sing it because the more we say it, the more we sing it, the more it's going to encourage us to believe it. But that can be a reason. Worship that doesn't affect the heart emotions may also be rooted in apathy or disobedience. When we are reminded of God's nature, His power and our need, but we don't worship through our heart, through our emotions, and our mind, we do it because there are other idols in our life that we are giving worth to. So we can't really worship God because we're worshiping other things. Other things have taken precedence. Other things have taken priority in our lives. These idols function as Jesus to us. And we find meaning and comfort there. And when we find meaning and comfort in those things, the greatness of Jesus is dimmed in our life. And guess what's going to happen as we come in to sing and respond to His Word? Well, our response is probably going to be dimmed. And so, we want to make sure that we are rooting what we sing and what we and how we worship in God's Word. We want to make sure that we are believing the truth that we sing. And then we also want to make sure that we aren't just apathetic and disobedient in some way, having reared up other idols in our life. As one theologian said, the heart is a perpetual idol factory. And you can walk out of here today with no idols in your heart, and guess what? Come back next Sunday with a few. So worship is a function of the heart, head, and emotions. But we need to avoid the ditches there. All right, here's the final thought in this. Worship that is all emotion can be rooted in experience and pleasing self and not rooted in knowledge. And thus isn't worship. Because it's not flowing from knowledge. It's not flowing from who God is, what He does, and our need for Him. The psalmist, as we look at this, he's clearly moved to exuberant worship by who God is, what He does, and our need for Him. But there are some, and you might have been here, I might have been here at some point, but there are some who seek worship experiences that don't spring from knowledge of God, but are designed to tug at the emotions and are meant to be driven by our emotions. Now, it's very clear that our emotions should be engaged. But I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, anytime we are driven by our emotions, the likelihood of us being driven by the Word of God or the Holy Spirit goes down. Our emotions are, are appropriate, but our emotions should fall in line with truth and follow behind truth and experience. I was reading a, a theologian this morning who said this. Uh, experience should follow faith and truth. It shouldn't be the determining factor in what we do. 
seen, uh, you, could, you could go from the, uh, from the craziest of the Pentecostals to the most fundamental of the Independent Baptists all the way over to the most seeker-friendly of the seeker-friendly churches, and you'll see this, how experience, if we're not careful, experience can rule the day. I've seen pastors, a good song is going on, and, and people are, and there's a lot of shouting going on, and he's like, well, I don't guess we'll need this tonight. And then they go and they sing the song again for 40 minutes. And hopefully the song, the song has some truth in it, but what is ultimately driving that when it comes down to it? This can happen in other ways. The way that we actually sing our music can be, can be designed to appeal to our emotions first and foremost. I, I talk with <laughs> our, our college students, we joke around about this. Um, just, I call them hyper-repetitive words. And just over and over and over and over and over and over the same thing. And they might be good words, but over and over and over the same thing is usually calling for an emotional response. Now, repetition is a valid, is a, is a valid approach to music. Go, go read Psalm 136. What is it, 36 verses? His steadfast love endures forever. Every single verse. Over and over and over and over again. So repetition can be good. We just don't want it to drive what we do ultimately. Worship must be in spirit, Jesus said in John 4, in spirit and in truth. So something is out of balance if we leave worship with an emotional high from the music, but little to no new awareness of who God is, what He does, and our need for Him. So, music, worship, preaching should supply knowledge so that our regenerated, spirit-filled hearts respond through our emotions and personalities. And that's why different people are going to different worship in different ways because we all have different personalities. You know, some people, this is that's about as crazy as they're going to get right there. That's fine. <laughs> uh, I saw one person talking once, they were talking about, you know, lifting your hands, and you're like, you know, they're, they're more like down here type people, under the pew where you don't see it. And narrow, and then you got a little bit wider right here. And, and that's fine. But you know what? It is okay. And it should happen that our emotions and our hearts are engaged as we sing about who God is, what He has done, and our need for Him. Every genre of Christian music can be subject to either one of these ditches. Every genre of Christian music can actually lead to an emotional response that's not rooted in knowledge. I personally, I personally believe this means that music that is drenched in truth, that also moves our heart and emotions towards God, is a good thing. Me, personally, I'm less concerned with form and more concerned with worship centered on who God is, what He does, and our need for Him. I hope that the truth that we look at here, or we look at here today, will just kind of marinate in our souls this week. Next Sunday's anniversary Sunday. I'm not asking anyone to come in here and you know get crazy or anything <laughs> like that. But as you meditate on this next week, I, I, I promise you there is going to be some music that is going to turn our gaze to Jesus. And, and would you come in with your heart prepared, Lord? I'm going to sing truth today. I'm going to hear truth today. Would you help me to come in and not just receive that knowledge, but to have my heart and my emotions impacted by what I see and what I hear and what I learn about you? If you don't mind, heads bowed, eyes closed.